My name is Kingsley Igobo, a communications officer in the Africa section of the Department of, of, of Global Communications, based here at the United Nations headquarters in New York. We are the organizers of this event uh, in partnership with the Office of the Special Advisor on Africa. Uh, the topic for today, bridging the gender digital gap in Africa, is a very pertinent one. You might want to ask why this topic. Uh, a few reasons for that. The first is, as you know, the AU theme for 2024 relates to education. Uh, mm -hmm. Happily, we have our AU youth envoy here, our dear sister Chido Pemba. Uh, that you cannot talk about education in the 21st century without talking about digital uh, component of it. And then the second factor is the Sustainable Development Goal 4, which also relates to education and talks about ensuring quality, equitable, and inclusive education. Inclusive and equitable, those two operative words, we know what that means. That also, obviously, gender is uh, part of that. And then one of the big summits that is happening later this year, September, the Summit of the Future. Uh, I've read the zero draft for that summit. If you, it, it's, uh, there's a focus on young people. There's a focus on digital cooperation among countries. And also there's a focus on the, on the uh, girls uh, and women in technology. Uh, lastly, uh, in a few days time, just two days, is the International Guest for ICT, ICT Day. Uh, that means that it's a day to celebrate guests in ICT, but also to encourage others to pursue STEM education, STEM, which is the acronym for science, technology, engineering, and math. As we know, there's a digital gender gap in Africa, and I'll leave that to the experts to speak to the issues surrounding that uh, topic. We're happy today to have uh, very important uh, people, uh, women, uh, techies. Uh, with us, we have uh, um, Ruth Umtua with us. We have Umbali Longwani. These are some of Africa's leading techies. They are experts in their areas. And of course, we have Dr. Emmanuel Manasse, uh, the Director for Africa Region at the International Telecommunications Union. I can't wait to hear from his. Uh, I can't wait to hear his uh, word of experience and also to drink from his well of experience. Um, and our dear sister Chido will moderate this session. Now, I'd like to talk quickly about who we are, what we do. Africa Renewal is our main product. Uh, it's a digital publication. It's not just because I work for Africa Renewal in the Africa section. Uh, it is undoubtedly one of the leading publications covering Africa's socioeconomic and political affairs. Hundreds of thousands of visitors come to our website on a monthly basis. We also have the Africa Renewal Newsletter, which is basically a curation of uh, the most important content uh, from our various platforms, including social media, Twitter, and Facebook. So you may want to subscribe to the newsletter and also follow us on, uh, on social media. The reason why we have a lot of credibility is because we are solutions oriented. We aim to inform, to engage, and to inspire action. So it's just not about talking about Africa in the context of the disease, the poverty, the hunger, the maladministration, the uh, coup d'etat. We talk about Africa, uh, focusing also on some of the positive developments that are happening on the continent. For example, we write a lot of youth profiles uh, of young people who are making remarkable progress in their society. Uh, we will focus, for example, on the fact that Rwanda has uh, the highest percentage of women parliamentarians in the world, in the entire world. Uh, we'll write a profile on uh, the Nigerian who recently became the world uh, chess champion. So we will feature ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Now, without much ado, I'll be handing over to my dear sister, Ms. Chido Upemba. Chido is the Youth Envoy at the African Union Commission where she champions youth development issues in Africa. She was appointed in November 2021 by the chairperson of the AUC, Musa Faki. She's the youngest, the youngest diplomat in the chairperson's cabinet. Before her current appointment, uh, Shido worked as a banker at the Chartered Cent uh, Standard Chartered Bank in Zimbabwe, 
and also for the country's Ministry of Youth, Arts, Sport and Recreation. She is, among other accolades, a 2016 Mandela Washington Fellow. Uh, Shido, we are really happy to have you here. Over to you to lead us through the proceedings. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kingsley, for that. And I'd just like to say welcome to everyone. It's such an honor and a privilege to moderate this session, particularly as we all know that in Africa, the largest demographic we have are the young people. And these young people are also affected the most when it comes to issues related to digital access, technology access. And without further ado, uh, just to respect time and also give time to our panelists, I would just like to perhaps just uh, make some groundbreaking rules uh, within this panel. Uh, we'll start off by just uh, indicating our panelists to be time conscious, where they have 10 minutes each to give their, um, you know, their perspective on this topic. And we will also conclude with a question and answer because we believe that it's important that we give our audience uh, an opportunity to also contribute to these um, discussions. Now, having said that, our first speaker for today is Dr. Emmanuel Manasseh. And Dr. Emmanuel Manasseh is an acting director at the ITU, which is the International Telecommunications Union at the Africa Regional Office. He will discuss a topic on addressing Africa's gender di digital divide. And just to give you a summary of uh, Dr. Emmanuel's profile, he has nearly two decades of experience in the telecommunications sector. He has also worked with Celtel Tanzania Limited as a telecommunications engineer, focusing on operation and maintenance of all base station subsystems. He's also He was also a board member of Tanzania Education and Research Network and a member of National ICT Skills Development Council. He's also a member of several professional institutes and bodies, including the Engineers Registration Board of Tanzania. Yeah, just to name a few. I'll now hand over to Dr. Manasseh to make his presentation in 10 minutes. Over to you, Dr. Manasseh. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me very well. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you very much, Shido. Thank you for preparing this important meeting. Thank you, Kinsley, and all other members. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I would like to address the issue of bridging the tech gender gap in Africa. And I believe that connecting women and girls with new and emerging technologies presents an opportunity to disseminate and scale up technological solutions that positively contribute to the social welfare and leverage the enormous potential of the women in the African continent. Certainly, building capabilities of women and girls to thrive in a digital world is a step toward a digitally inclusive society. To bridge the tech gender gap in Africa, women and girls need digital empowerment. We need to prioritize inclusive education fit for this digital age. We need to get African girls into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics with the digital life skills they need to succeed. Likewise, we need to ensure women and girls have equal access to digital technologies and opportunity. As a specialized UN agents for ICT with the overall mission to connect and connect it, ITU has been working hard to leave no one unconnected and to make sure that vulnerable groups such as women, girls, children, and young people are included in the use of digital technologies. To ensure that girls are not only heard but understood, not only engaged, but empowered, and not only contribute to, but leading in the adoption and use of frontier technologies, ITU has leveraged young girls' knack for digital innovation and entrepreneurship, and has meaningfully engaged them and put them in a position to tangibly and efficiently contribute in transforming Africa into a digitally empowered society. Some of the initiatives include, but not limited to, the African Girl Can Code initiatives that aim to equip girls with digital skills and coding capabilities. The African Network of Women, which is a community of female delegates that aim to build a network 
share experiences and provide mentorship to young girls. The African youth group under the Generation Connect initiatives have provi provides a platform for a participative process for youth to contribute to different ongoing activities and advance inclusive digital transformation in Africa. Tech as a driver of women's economic opportunity and annual, yes, another initiative is Tech as a driver of women for economic opportunities. And also we have the annual girls in ICT celebration. This year, the girls in ICT will be on 25th April under the theme of leadership. We hope you can all join us in the global celebration. Despite the effort made, access to the internet and meaningful connectivity to ensure a safe, productive and affordable line experience for all is still a challenge. According to ITU statistics, the percentage of individuals using the internet in Africa in 2023 was 37%. Specifically, 32% are females compared to 42% males have access to internet. Considering that connectivity is a prerequisite to access ICT benefits. Collaborative efforts are needed to build robust ICT infrastructure. Affordability continues to be an important barrier to universal connectivity. Although the largest statistics show significant improvement in affordability, there's always more to do. ICT services are still expensive to the majority of Africans. Still expensive ICT services are preventing men, women, and girls from using the internet and from having a safe, satisfying, and reaching and a productive online experience. Detailed statistical evidence is a starting point for devising policies and creating conditions to achieve universal and meaningful connectivity. In 2022, 68% of men owned mobile phones compared to 52% of, of females which reveals a digital gender divide. Addressing these digital gender gaps is crucial as owning a mobile phone, particularly a smartphone, significantly increases mobile internet awareness and use among both men and women. We need to explore various device financing schemes to enable inclusive access to devices for all. Enabling policy in the regulatory environment is important for sustainable digital development and increase the adoption of ICT. Policies that emphasizes on digital inclusion, in particular, gender inclusive, digital policy can change not just digital, but overall socioeconomic uh, development outcomes for the better. Finally, as a call to action, it is critical to establish and strengthen multi-stakeholder partnership across all stakeholders, government, development partners, academia, the private sectors, and others, to collaborate closely to empower girls and young women within the local digital ecosystem. Through such collaborative efforts, sharing of knowledge and best practices, we can together bridge the tech gender gap. I also invite you to look at the ITU handbook on mainstreaming gender in digital policies. To incorporate gender mainstreams, mainstreaming in digital policies and regulatory frameworks. As a concluding remark, the most important skill for young girls are self-confidence, reliance, and curiosity. Let's empower girls to take ownership of their career choices and use digital technology and its access to improve for improved social economic well-being. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Manasseh, for that and uh, so many nuggets that you've shared. I was literally taking notes, uh, you know, whilst you were making that presentation. And it really is true that we really need to find ways that we can bridge this digital divide that not only affects the young people on our continent, but also affects uh, women within our continent. And it's important that we also work uh, hand in hand with the private sector, with the public sector, with multilateral institutions, with institutions like ITU, to make sure that we address uh, this issue we're faced with on the continent.
continent. I'm really glad as well, as I'm seeing, uh, you know, the chats that are popping in, we're also having this conversation. I'm seeing people that have joined from Mali, I believe. I've seen South Africa. I've seen Dr. Mercy, who's just joined right now. Welcome to everyone. I've seen Leon, who's here. Welcome to everyone. And, you know, um, I hope we can continue with these discussions. And uh, having said that, allow me to move on to our next speaker for the day, Ms. Ruth Mtua. And Ruth is another youth giant who's also in the tech industry, and she is a co-founder of DroneX Technologies. And Ruth will speak on the topic of overcoming challenges and seizing opportunities in the digital industry. So now just to give you a summary of uh, Ruth's profile, she's currently pursuing a PhD in biomedical engineering at Virginia Tech. She's also the co-founder and lead of DroneX Technologies, as I previously mentioned, and drone a drone and data company that develops customized solutions using drone technology. Now, with a first class in biomedical engineering and a non-degree certificate from Wayne State University, she's also a certified drone pilot. This is amazing. Power to the women. Additionally, she serves as a staff associate at the Malawi University of Science and Technology, where she holds the role of matron for the MUST Association of Female Engineers. Ruth has also garnered numerous awards and honors for her contributions to the field, including the Global U Grad Exchange Program and the Best Innovation Award for Agritech Entrepreneurship Challenge and the National Bank Best Student Award. Ruth, you have the floor. If I may ask you to unmute your mic and then proceed to uh, give your presentation. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, thank you. Um, um, yes, um, it's great to come after also a speaker who has highlighted uh, most of the important things that we need to be looking at as far as uh, digital inclusion goes in Africa. Um, as a woman in STEM, I think I've had the firsthand experience of, exp of seeing how much um, we need to overcome these barriers mm -hmm. if as a continent we are to move forward in the digital space. Um, so the first thing that I would like to um, talk about is um, firstly, um, how the digital space thrives on infrastructure. And I believe in Africa, that is one thing that we need to be talking about as we're talking about digital inclusion. So we need to be um, talking about how we can build structures that are going to support um, the advancement of digital technology. And one of the things that, as was already mentioned, was uh, things like internet accessibility, the affordability of the internet itself. Um, I believe um, over the past years, we have been moving towards getting the internet more accessible. And uh, this is, uh, we are moving in the right direction. And um, as far as the digital space goes, um, we need to make sure that we are um, also um, make we are also preparing a platform so that whenever we have these digital products, we have these digital services, um, they are able to thrive. Um, so one thing that I saw was that um, there the platforms where we need the digital space to exist are not as adequate as they need to be. So the internet accessibility, the affordability, even the electricity. So it, as we are talking about digital advancement, we also need to be preparing in terms of the infrastructure. And then we also need to take a holistic approach in as far as um, advocating for digital um, ad advocating for digital uh, advancement in Africa. Uh, what I mean by this is that we shouldn't only be talking about uh, gaining the skills for women, but we should also look at the root cause or the root problems that make women not to be, be able to participate fully in the digital space. And uh, one of the things that um, I saw practically was that our culture, we need to also have um, a strategy that will influence our culture towards uh, changing the stereotype that uh, digital products are not just for women. So even from a young age, women have to be introduced to these digital products. Uh, you can agree with me, whenever a household has access to a digital product, they will prioritize giving access to a male child compared to um, a woman or compared to a girl. And um, unknowingly, we are indoctrinating uh, these men to become uh, people who grow up to be interested in the digital space or interested in STEM products. And um, 
this is something that we need to work on. So take a holistic approach um, towards um, changing the stereotypes that exist around STEM. And the other thing obviously would be that um, the digital space is largely dependent on the literacy skills. So even the general things such as reading and writing and which is something we're still lagging behind as a continent when it comes to women. Um, women are being overburdened um, with uh, taking care of the domestic life and um, they're not um, prioritized when it comes to education. And unfortunately, this needs to change if we are to make uh, meaningful um, advancements in the digital space. And um, another thing would be the language, which also comes to speak on how a holistic approach, uh, how holistic the approach has to be if we're going to overcome these barriers that we're facing. So um, the, the digital space, um, now we're communicating in English and it is easy because um, we started from the basics uh, before moving on to saying, OK, we're now entering the digital space. We were introduced to these things like the language. Um, we know how to read. We know how to write when in the most uh, common official language, which is English. So we need to also start from the grassroots and tell women and make sure that women are having access to these basics um, that will enable them to thrive in the digital space. And um, yeah, I think uh, we also need to advocate for more women to take more leadership positions. I think it is easier for women at a young age to move forward in the STEM field when they see that there are people they could look up to, there are people they could relate to. Um, I think in my experience as a matron for the Female Engineers Club, one one approach that we took was that we went to the secondary schools, to the high schools, where um, we get introduced to different careers. And we were not just speaking to the women about STEM, but we practically were doing projects with the women to show them how they could apply uh, what they're learning in class, because at that time, the only thing they could relate to was math and they had nothing practical to attach it to. So uh, using that approach, we we're able to get uh, the girls a little bit more interested when they saw um, the importance and what we were doing with the STEM field. So in short, this is um, these are some of the things that I think we should do and move forward uh, to move forward as a continent as far as the digital space is concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ruth, for that. Uh, such a power-packed presentation and so many nuggets that we've gotten from this, from digital literacy being key, holistically uh, looking at how we can bridge the digital divide for women. Language barrier as well, something that we need to look at, as well as starting from our grassroots. And lastly, to advocate for more women to take more leadership positions. So at this point, I will hand over to Ms. Mbali to make her presentation. Over to you. Um, thank you so much. Um, greetings to everybody. Um, I can see in the chats that we've got um, young people who are joining from across the world. It is so lovely to see um, um, all the engagement. Thank you so much again for the invitation. My name is Mbali Shongwane. I am all the way in South Africa in Johannesburg. And I like to say, my vision is always ensuring that women are at the forefront of the tech transformation. So a little bit about myself, I started Pink Coders Africa based on my own personal experiences as a woman in tech. Um, a couple of years ago, I was the only female in a team of five guys uh, where we were working on the Innovate Durban Hackathon Challenge, which was hosted by the local municipality and IBM from the United States. And I remember being the only female in a team of five guys where our team eventually won the challenge. And so I had so many exciting opportunities that I could have taken on, but instead I really looked around and said, how do we bring more women into the tech industry? For the past five, for the past six years, I have been focused on ensuring that we are able to equip young women, African women specifically with in-demand technical skills so that they are able to meet some of the industry requirements to ensure that women are able to actively participate within the tech industry. 
Today, as we speak, Pink Code is Africa is an organization that had a reach of over 200,000 women. These are women that are from um, South Africa. We also have reach in countries like Kenya, Morocco, and looking to really expand across the African continent. Our focus in, in programs is training women in software development, data science, um, machine learning, AI, cybersecurity, and so forth. We have exciting projects that we've been able to develop as Pink Code is Africa, where we've got a project around football and data science that has exciting opportunities to be able to be hosted at the 2026 FIFA World Cup. Again, I share this to say to young women out there, it is so important for us to be able to equip young women, not only for them to be able to go into employment, but really equipping young women to ensure that they are able to access entrepreneurship opportunities, but also going into spaces where women are minority and being able to use those skill sets for women to be able to innovate. And so for my talk, I really wanted to focus around some of the um, um, challenges that women face um, when trying to enter into the tech industry, some of the difficulty women face, really some of the biggest barriers that are impending women's access to utilizing digital technology in Africa. And one of the biggest one is limit, limited access um, to infrastructure. Though Africa is really booming with so many potentials and so many opportunities, we've got a number of programs that are focused on ensuring that women are able to be equipped with in-demand technical skills. But one of the biggest things that we still struggle with is access to infrastructure. There's still a large number of communities um, um, within Africa where young women do not have access to information, whether it be a tech device, um, um, cell phone, being able to stay connected and so forth. And so for us, really, the most important thing is how do we ensure that women within some of the um, um, disadvantaged communities are able to have access to some of these opportunities, have access to some of these learning materials um, and, and, and information Again, more than anything around um, um, limited access to infrastructure, it's also them being able to afford digital devices. Uh, women in Africa really who are from these rural areas um, and underrepresented areas where access to these resources is really a scarcity. So I'd love to, I think, while we have our engagements and our conversations, for us to really start thinking around how do we ensure that we can make some of these um, um, access to information much more easier? How do we ensure that we can also make access to um, devices much more affordable for women in different areas um, um, across Africa? And the second one is around gender disparity in education. As being because of Africa, we want to always ensure that women are at the forefront of tech transformation. And so we do understand um, some of these change, these challenges that women have been facing. Um, and as Pink Code is Africa, we work with our amazing partners to ensure that we are able to meet some of these challenges that women face. And that is by ensuring that we've created safe spaces for them to come in and work from. We've ensured that we've got um, um, access to technology, access to information that women can be able to access within these different communities. As we stand in 2024, um, over 85 million jobs uh, will be available, tech specific jobs will be available in 2025. So I think the conversation today is how do we ensure that out of those 85 million jobs, women form a majority of them to be able to access these opportunity? How do we ensure that women have sufficient digital skills to be able to participate into these um, employment um, and also looking at skills of the future? So things like critical thinking and problem solving, how do we ensure that women are able to participate um, um, in some of these opportunities and gaining some of these soft skills that are required for them to be to be able to actively participate at the forefront of this transformation. Reskilling, um, um, this um, statistics are um, um, from the World Economic Forum show that 50% of all employees will need to be reskilled by 2025. And therefore, we do understand the demand for technical skills, but how do we ensure that the 50% of the individuals that are being upskilled, half of them, if not all of them, are also young women? Um, that require these skills. I also wanted to touch on examples of careers in tech. While technology is an exciting conversation, a number of times you find young women really saying, well, um, does it mean I can only be a coder? Does it mean that I can only do boring lines of code and work for a bank? And the answer is no. 
So I wanted to share some of these exciting um, um, employment opportunities or rather careers that young women can start building from. Um, and first of all, is it's the software developer. So there's an opportunity to become a software developer if you're a young person, really talented and passionate about tech. Um, and really around software development is how do you design, develop, test software applications and systems. But if you're somebody who's perhaps maybe not um, um, into software development and you're rather a numbers person, there's also um, career opportunities around data scientist. So being able to analyze and interpret complex data, um, inform business decisions and solve problems for those that love numbers. There's also cybersecurity specialist job opportunities out there. So this is where we are able to protect digital assets, networks from cybersecurity and cyber, um, cyber threats and cyber attacks. Another opportunity is around if a younger, a young female um, um, loves design, there's a UX and UI designer. Um, this is being able to create user-friendly interactions, design engaging user experiences for websites, applications, and so forth. Another one is also being gamer. Um, um, I'm sharing all of this because we do understand that majority of the time, young females um, um, do share their frustrations of not really understanding some of the available um, um, career opportunities for them out there in tech. And so another one is becoming a gamer. We've seen a lot more young females really um, um, being excited around the gaming industry, how they can build um, um, careers around gaming. Um, and that is also another industry um, that is quite open and quite exciting and that has a great future for young women that, that are interested in building a career um, um, in tech. And I think lastly, before I close, my point is around um, the biggest question that we, we regularly get asked around why the engagement of women in digital transformation matters. So what if women are not a part of the transformation? So what if women are not at the forefront of these opportunities? Really, the first one is diverse perspectives and innovation. We all know that women bring unique perspectives, experiences, and problem-solving approaches to digital transformation. And so by involving women, organizations can tap into a broader range of ideas and innovations, leading into a more creative solution products that matter. We obviously do not currently have a female Mark Zuckerberg, but we are wanting women to actively participate in tech because we are hoping that in the near future, we have amazing women from across the world that are able to build some of the um, best innovations that we've yet to see. Um, and those coming from young female. The other one and why it matters that women are part of digital transformation and why they need to be at the forefront is economic growth and competitiveness. So women represent a significant portion of our global workforce um, and the participation in digital economy is crucial for driving an economic growth and competitiveness. Empowering women with digital skills and opportunity not only enhances individual economic prospects, but also contributes to overall economic development by increasing productivity. The last one is social inclusion. By being able to ensure that women are at the forefront, the digital transformation landscape has the potential to bridge um, so um, um, social um, divides and greater inclusion and equality. However, without the active participation of women, there's a risk of widening existing gender disparities and access to technology and um, um, education. Thank wow. you. Wow. So Thank you. Thank you very much, Mbali, uh, for that. Uh, really, so many. Uh, nuggets that you've shared in your presentation from 50% of people who need to be reskilled by 2025. Did you say 2025, which is literally, yes. did I get that right? Which is next year. So we really have a long way to go, even when we're discussing about the summit of the future. I mean, currently we know in Addis, uh, they're currently uh, having the consultations for summit of the future. We know in May, we're going to have the UN Civil Society Forum on the Summit of the Future. And I think these are key contributions as well that are coming from young people and what we need to look at, even when you talk about the future, but we also need to look as far as tomorrow to say by next year, 50% of people need to be reskilled. Looking at reskilling, looking at the you know skills for the future is, is very crucial and important. Um, you raised a point about... Um, 
women have to be in the forefront for the tech transformation, but also looking at access to information and access to infrastructure is also quite key and, and, and relevant to, to, to these discussions. Now, having said that, I'd just like to thank our three panelists for um, you know this insightful conversation and um, you know what you've presented, and uh, we're going to move on to the question and answer session. It is now time to hear from those of you who have participated from various parts of the world. And if you have not done so already, please make sure to send your questions in the chat room and we will post them to our guest speakers who will respond accordingly. But in the meantime, I have been receiving some questions uh, uh, you, through uh, the ones that you've submitted and the ones I've also received from, from the team I'm working with. And I will proceed with the first three that have come in. But please continue to um to provide us with these questions. So now the first question that we have is from Vivita, Velvita Viban. Uh, good to know that you're here, Velvita. And your question is, beyond the conventions and advocacy policies, what are we doing to ensure that we are setting targets and review mechanisms in our regional bodies that ensure that digital access and inclusion moves from paper to action. Anyone who can take this question, if you'd like me to repeat it, whilst you reflect on who takes the question, the question from Viveta is beyond the conventions and advocacy policies, what are we doing to ensure that we're setting targets and review mechanisms in our regional bodies that ensure that digital access and inclusion moves from paper to action? I'll pass this over to Dr. Emmanuel to please um respond accordingly thank you over to you yeah thank you very much and I, this question is really uh impressing and well thought question honestly uh from itu point of view uh our targets we are result based based our uh, result based management and our our actions and target are toward the results that can be measured. As I said, for example, a good example, we want to connect and connect and to make sure that no one is left behind. For example, when you look at our strategic goals and how we measure, for example, we had uh, some two years back where there were 3 billion people unconnected. Today we have 2.6 billion, 2 billion connected and various initiatives are taking place. But a very good example, as I said, we have, just uh, as I was explaining in the uh, in the the keynote that I was giving, you see, like African girls can code now is a hands-on um, practice where we have various girls camp and then they are taught how to code. But also we have ECOS program, and now we are moving on. We want to have a program that will even involve girls from many African countries, but to put them in the hands-on activities. But uh, another most important thing that also is a coordinated and a streamlined effort across administrations. If now you go back to those in high schools and other places, you can see most of these science education, science, engineering, and technology, you see most of these girls in science and technologies, there's an increased number of uh, girls in uh, science and they're doing great job, which means that the multiplying effect in the coming few years is going to be great. So um, I believe that much needs to be done, but I appreciate that various administration have taken this seriously and soon uh, there are good things to come than what we see now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel, for taking that question. And we also like to open up the same question to the rest of the panelists, if there's anyone who'd also like to respond to it. Okay, so take it. Um, uh, Ruth, is there anything you'd like to contribute? Or you, we can move to the next question. Okay, I think there might be, she might be having technic yeah, technical. Can you hear me? Yes, so we can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to say I read the question and um, 
I think uh, from my perspective, um, to be able to actually assess um, how we are moving from paper to practical things, I think it is important that um, we start assessing the success of our programs, even from like the most basic level. So we can have a national policy, that's great. But I think locally, we should also have um, specific, we can even talk about individual people in groups that are looking to see um, wh what what is the, the rate of uh, digital access? How are we moved as a group, as a community from mm. um, having digital access? So it should really start from the most basic level. Uh, and I think that's how we can actually achieve uh, meaningful progress uh, in as far as digital literacy is concerned. Mm. Thank you, Ruth, for that. And, you know, a follow up question to this is what measures can be taken? This is from Rosaline Adewi. And her question is what measures can be taken to increase the representation of women in leadership positions within the tech sector? And I think I'll give this uh, over to you, Ruth, because I know you did mention um, the need for us to, uh, you know, increase leadership in it for women in tech as well as to Bali. And we we'll start with Ruth to answer this. Okay. Um, yeah, so we know for a fact we already have women who are in STEM right now. And I think one of the things that they could do is being a little more um a little more proactive in making sure that um they let those that are um or the people that are coming after them know what the benefits of STEM are and how being in STEM um gives them a platform to uh voice their unique perspectives so i think just having people in the st women in stem who are um very vocal about um the benefits of stem from a woman's perspective could be something that is beneficial and um we should also advocate for uh, competency uh, in our skills as women um so we should not just um uh, uh, be given special treatment just because we're women. And um, also we shouldn't be denied opportunities because we're women. So mm -hmm. um, the structures that we're talking about that we need to create for digital things or for the digital space to thrive in Africa are also things like those. Are we giving women that opportunity to, 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 to have a position where they can influence? So um I think those are some of the things that I can immediately think of and some of the things that I've actually seen practically working uh, in my case. Gotcha. Thank you, Ruth, for sharing that and practical examples as well within your case and the space you've been working in. And I'll hand over the same question to Mbali. If you can just uh, let us know what measures do you think can be taken to increase the representation of women in leadership positions within the tech sector? Thank you so much for the question. Um, so 100%, I think, um, though we speak about women um, um, in leadership roles in tech, one of the things that we've seen is there's a number of companies, organizations um, that have female employed um, within their tech organization. But what you'll find is the female is either head of finance, a head of HR. Um, they are not um, 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 within some of the decision makers um, um, within that organization. And I think one of the biggest ways that we can tackle this is one by mentorship. I think mentorship is one of the biggest ways in which we can start to mentor young women into some of these positions. Um, a current uh, um, um, manager, leader within an organization, how do they start mentoring um, um, the next um, um, individual that's going to be filling their position? I think this is one of the best ways where these young individuals can get not only mentors, but learn from people that have walked the walk, right? Majority mm -hmm. of the time. Uh, women do have a number of, of issues that they struggle with, whether it be imposter syndrome, um, um, and some of these challenges can really be tackled by so with somebody who's walked the journey that can be able to assist them in really preparing them for the role. Um, a majority of the time, women find themselves in these big positions that they were not prepared for, and they still have a lot of challenges that are failed to deal with. With um, um, Nine out of 10 times ends up in women either changing their careers um, um, or them just feeling like the environment that they are in is, is, is not the best for them. And so I think to retain some of the talents that already exist and take and to ensure they're able to grow to leadership roles, I think actively putting in, in place mentorship structures within organizations to ensure that we are able to um, um, 
um, kind of inspire or rather mentor women into these positions. And I think then the next one also that I wanted to um, um, perhaps maybe share um, as another tool that could be used to ensure that women are able to be inspired into, uh, into leadership roles is by being able to see women that are in these roles today. And I think um, the speaker mm -hmm. before me really talked about how do we then ensure that the ones that are in those positions are able to actively speak about the amazing stuff that they are doing within these organizations. Women do not have role models within the tech industry, though we speak about the gap, though we speak about the challenges, and though we have women that are within this industry, I do not think they are visible enough for young women to really be inspired and really understand that this is a position and these are careers that they can take on. So two things for me, mentorship and how do we then actively ensure that the individuals that are within those leadership roles are able to be role models, um, talk about the work that they are doing, talk about their journeys, really be profiled in a way that is able to inspire young women. Um, I think we've seen enough of Mark Zuckerberg. We'd love to see um, other women, and there are a lot of businesses founded by um, women in tech, but we do not see them on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And that means that there's very little um, um, or very few women that are going to be taking up those positions because they just do not see it happening. Therefore, they do not think it's possible for them. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Bali, for this. And uh, just to check in case our he for she, Dr. Emmanuel, has any input into this as well. From your perspective, how can we increase women in leadership positions and their representation within the tech sector? Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes, uh, I think as I was saying that we need to get the African girls into science, technology, engineering and mathematics at an mm -hmm. earlier age and empower women and girls with digital life skills they need to succeed. Because um, sometimes it's about uh, critical mass. Mm -hmm. So the more you have women into science, into STEM, it means the more you're going to have leaders, the more you're going to have uh, also qualified engineers, qualified uh, and uh, experienced leaders. So they take more girls, to stem in their earlier age, you will create uh, a strong leadership. And I think this is quite uh, obvious because as uh, I think it was uh, Sophie was saying that most of the human resource uh, directors are women, is it? Most of them. And they're very good at human resource mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. administration. That just tells us that taking them to those subjects, majority of them, just it resulted to them taking the, the the highest position in those areas. So the more we will take our young ladies into STEMs, uh, it means in some years to come, we're going to have leaders uh, dominating the tech sector as well. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that, um, for, for, for answering that, Dr. Emmanuel. And I totally agree with that. And I, I would say, even when it comes to education, we see the crucial role of education in all of this. How do we start from an early age? How do we ensure that even subjects related to STEM, uh, you know, have more young women as well enrolling for them? And just to give a specific example, which I actually heard in, in, in one session I attended to a few months ago, and a country-specific example, for instance, I think it's Sierra Leone, where they've introduced free STEM education in their schools. And this is a, as, as a way to also attract uh, more young people within STEM, but also targeted as women within STEM. So I think it's important as well to see how government plays a role, how policy plays a role, and how we can transform education in a way that can also bridge this digital divide. Having said that, it also brings me to my next question. And this question comes from John Mark Obifuna, part of my pronunciation. And the question from John Mark is, what is the best way to influence government policies as it applies to tech inclusion? Uh, John Mark goes to say from his experience, government policies and regulations impact initiatives such as this in multiple ways. I will hand this over again to our panelists, uh, just uh, if anyone could, could take this question. What is the best way to influence government policies as it applies to the tech inclusion 
And from John Mark's experience, government policies and regulations impact initiatives such as this in multiple ways. Anyone to take that one? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to take this one. And you mentioned something that is very interesting. Uh, I visited one country, I think Tanzania, the president there is a woman and she started the, oh, yes. the Samia mm -hmm. Solo scholarship for girls from first term. So you can see that is a vivid example that you were giving. And that I think mm. is a very good motivation that many women say are going to that. So we commend for the good job. But as I said also, um, African girls can code was also meant to motivate girls at their uh, young age to start coding and loving these coding uh, schemes. But also ECOs have the same thing. Um, I can give you another good example that I've noticed in most of the African countries. When they wanted to motivate the policies for a certain area, for example, if you want to motivate more girls to go to STEM, you see that um, not everybody got the scholarship or the loan for studies in higher learning institution. But you see some of the countries, they have made it that any girl that goes for STEM is going to get a scholarship. I think that's a very good policy and good motivation that will mm -hmm. bring motivate mm. many to join. And is it practical that even those who doesn't have money or those who have limited resources, still the government is there to make sure that every talent is promoted by providing the assistance. And I think this goes also way, way even in primary primary school, some they made it free, some they still support these girls and secondary schools to make sure that all girls have equal rights. But on top of that, also you see um, ITU, we are advocating the connectivity of schools. The main objective is connect all schools so that we provide equal opportunities for everyone to learn in the underserved and unserved areas, as well as those in urban areas, because giving access to online um, tools and e-learning platform, as well as contents, also can harness the take side of these young girls and they can go further because they have equal access to material and knowledge at those in um, in urban and other places. So I think these are some of the practical issues that if governments could embrace, could help really to, to even the playing field, to create mm. a level field where all could benefit regardless of the background, regardless of the location. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you for that, Emmanuel. I think this takes me to the next question, which came from Bennett Simbeye. And this question from Bennett Simbeye is, how do we deal with the low tech skills as well as access to technology among women, especially in rural areas of most African countries? I think um, one of the panelists, um, must have been Ruth or Ombani, had mentioned in this regard to say, um, you know, access for women infrastructure is a challenge, but how do we address this in, in, in that perspective of that access to people in rural areas or in the African countries? And I'll, I'll hand this over to Mbali to answer. Thank you so much for the question. Um, a hundred percent. So, so we have identified that um, not just women communities in disadvantaged areas um, are less likely to have access to um, whether it be information technology, um, and this is due to the fact that there is no infrastructure that currently exists. And I think one of the ways in which we can combat some of these, uh, what we've done is, for example, running boot camps, being able to um, take some of our partners into some of these communities. Majority of the time in communities, there's community halls. So how do we access these community halls, bring in laptops and actually being able to run boot camps? So how do we take what currently exists into some of these conversations, I mean, into some of these com co um, communities? Because 100% um, um, waiting for government to be able to implement these structures uh, sometimes takes quite some time. So how do we ensure that currently with what we have, uh, we are able to equip these women in these different communities? And so again, from our end, we have really been actively um, going into different communities. There are community halls, setting up a couple of laptops, being able to bring in whether it be VR code, um, um, some robotics, just being able to start by introducing them to some of these different elements that exist. Um, because unfortunately, 
the urban and the rural areas um, are two different kind of communities. And so what ends up happening majority of the time is the only people that are able to access these opportunities are individuals that are in the urban areas, meaning that young women that are born in rural areas are definitely left behind. And so how do we take current existing infrastructures and go into these different communities with some of our partners with some of these programs? How do we run, um, um, for example, the, the, the coding initiatives that doctors keep speaking about? How do we take some of those initiatives and maybe run a two-day training workshop into um, a mm -hmm. disadvantaged community? Because I believe this is one of the ways in which we can start introducing them um, to technology, start introducing them to these different skill sets uh, while we build on some permanent solutions for these communities. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for your input on that in Bali. And just to check, uh, Ruth, do you have anything to add on to that? But that is very, very great in Bali. We see a comment from Vivelta, which says, great in Bali. Uh, thank you for for, for sharing uh, in, more insight on that. And I'll just hand over to Ruth as well to contribute specifically on this topic of access for women in rural areas and tech. No, I think she has um, really explained it well. Um, I think the only um, a good approach would be introducing the women to the aspects of uh, the digital space. And um, I think we also have to be very realistic of how much of an effort it will take to actually get to a place where uh, digital inclusion is something that is uh, that is progressing in the rural areas because there are a lot of things infrastructure wise that have to be addressed. So um, starting with the boot camps, starting with the small programs that um, introduce the girls to some of the aspects of the digital uh, space uh, is something that is really important. And um, I think communities also have to be very intentional about um, introducing the girls to the STEM. So whenever, um, they get access, um, they have to make sure that um, men or boys are not prioritized or they're not um, chosen over the women. And uh, this is something that we also have to address culturally that whenever they have access to resources, they don't prioritize men or they don't prioritize boys as people to have primary access. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's all I could say. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for that, Ruth. And another question coming from Hastings, Hastings Hatton. And this question is, how can policymakers and private sector entities effectively collaborate to foster an inclusive digital ecosystem that promotes equitable opportunities for both genders in technology related fields, specifically in regions like Africa? Where STEM programs often prioritize girls, how can we ensure balanced access to such opportunities, especially for boys from remote and underdeserved areas? Okay. Anyone to take that one? Okay. As 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 we prepare for a panelist to take yeah, that I, one, maybe maybe uh, I can go. Sure. Yes. All right. Okay. That is indeed a Please great question. Ahead. It is indeed a great question, first of all. And thank you for asking mm -hmm. that question because, uh, you know, most of the private sectors, they are up to business oriented and there is not that much interest in collaborating to assist in education, for example, innovative financing and education. But uh, one thing that is happening today, we know that for most of these tech companies, especially in Africa and other places, for them to strive, they also need to have a digit, local digital skills that will produce content that is appealing to them society. Uh, I remember someone who was talking uh, in our panel mentioned that we are speaking English here, but how many people that cannot speak English, but they need content? So uh, we see nowadays even private companies investing and supporting in education because we need to increase local content. I was giving one mm. example that, you know, most of the TVs in our local areas are watched by many simply because the content and the language is appealing to them. But the biggest question is when I take my smartphone, if my mom take the smartphone, if my grandma take the smartphone, 
does she see the culture and applications and the services and content that is appealing and relevant to her that matters a lot. But to get that content, it means uh, tech service companies, they should invest uh -huh. in education so that we produce local scientists, local data analysts, local developers who will who understand the culture and produce something that is appealing to the culture. So I see in that aspect that both public and private sectors, they need to join hand in enhancing technologies from the earlier age to all students, to all young people, because young people, they're hungry for these technologies and they can produce solutions that are solve the pressing needs of the society. So that should be a pursuit and the policy should be put in place that it's not only those from urban area, they are intelligent. We see uh, also that, for example, another good example is immediately most of the governments now, they, are putting, they, are, they have instituted uh, secondary schools in local, in, in assembly areas. And that started to big number of universities, students coming from those areas. That is a very good policy initiative that they realized that those years, it's not that people were not smart, but only the university has limited number. So some were not choosing even to proceed with the education. But now with this increase in uh, schools, that's the first step that was done. But as I said, now private sector mm -hmm. that want to thrive, they should invest at the ground to make sure that they equip uh, these uh, scientists, these uh, young youngsters who are doing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, so that they can reap the benefit when they get local content that is appealing and thereby digitally include anybody in that. So it's a policy that is taking place though slowly, but uh, more importantly is this is the time for private sector to to see that for them to thrive, they should invest at primary and secondary schools so that we they get uh, the society that understands the local environment and the culture and to produce appealing content to that society. That's the only big thing that they can thrive. Because uh, taking foreign contents alone, you are leaving a big number of your customers unattended and unconnected and also left behind in this digital era. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you for that, Dr. Emmanuel. And, you know, this leads me to our last question that are like the, the ladies. In fact, we've lost two last questions and specifically I'll post these uh, to Mbali and Ruth. Uh, one of them being on, it's coming from Titi, Titi Ogo Ndambi, pardon my pronunciation, but Titi's question is finance is a huge gap in implementing digital transformation projects in grassroots communities, especially for women. Please give us some ways to raise funds for digital projects. And I think you'll be the best of uh, suited to, to, you know, contribute and respond to this, given that you both, um, you know, co-founders and founders of various initiatives related to, you know, digital transformation. How would you actually advise other young women other young people that are looking at this, but are find, trying to find ways on how they can raise funds for their digital projects. We'll start with you in Bali and we'll proceed with Ruth afterwards. Um, Bali, you're on, mute, you're on mute. Thank you so much for the question. Um, whew, I think um, um, the conversation around finance is, is, is quite a difficult one, given the fact that we understand that it is very difficult for women to try and raise funding as a whole for businesses. Um, it is said that investment um, um, usually goes towards uh, male starter, uh, male founders. Um, um, as opposed to female founders. And so already we we are not starting at, at an equal level. And so irregardless of the innovation, regardless of the business, uh, mm -hmm. women regularly just need to constantly try and improve their businesses, prove their work, prove that they know what they are doing. And so one of the best strategies that I personally use and that I've recognized um, a couple of other female founders using is bootstrapping. So this means that how do you start a concept or rather how do you start a business and try to test it out. Um, um, if, for, for example, you are running an initiative and um, 
you need companies to be able to fund um, 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 for these projects? How do you start from nowhere? So that by the time you are going to large organizations to raise for funding, you've already got a proven track record of the concept. You've already been able to have some beneficiaries, maybe run a free program, um, um, and we're able to maybe get two laptops that you were able to find or, or purchase and were able to teach some kids from that. Um, um, bootstrapping is one of the best ways that I felt um, was one able to kind of um, give us credibility in the work that we're doing. But also sometimes because as female founders, it is already very, very difficult to try and raise for funding. Women regularly always have to go the extra mile to try and prove their concept, prove their businesses, um, and therefore making funders, donors really, really um, 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 hesitant to fund um, projects and concepts. However, the second one is really building um, um, a very strong network. Um, so I would say if you've got an initiative, you've got a concept that you want to get off the ground, how do you really start building those partnerships, really start networking, really utilizing whether it be um, platforms like LinkedIn, connecting with some of these organizations that you'd love to partner with, get sponsorship from, get support from, how do you start building those partnerships? And that is also something that I've seen work quite well um, for female founders because of the fact that um, um, sometimes it is these relationships that are able to stand um, um, stick with us throughout the journey of our of our initiatives. These are the um, initiatives that are able to back the work that we're doing, but also they're usually the, the initiatives that take the first jump at saying, I believe in what you're doing. So building those relationships, building those networks, really ensuring that you are investing, being in the space, really getting um, 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 organizations to understand what it is that you're trying to do. Um, and then the second part is really bootstrapping. If you are able to find ways around how do I start with nothing that really does go a long way for funders, for donors, um, because you are able to have that track record of saying, listen, it works, listen, it is needed, listen, it is a solution that 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 works for my community. And I've tested it. I've got 10 young girls that have really shown interest. How do we ensure that we are able to expand and, and, and build this out with your support? And those are some of the two ways um, um, that I think are quite useful and that I've seen become really, really, really useful um, for some of the female founders that are in my circle and have personally also worked for me. Hmm. Thank you for that, Badi. And I'll hand this over to Ruth as well to respond. Yes, can you hear me? I think um, there is a noise in my environment, I'm not sure. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you clearly. All right. Um, I think she has um I she has said uh what could be said in as far as funding goes. And um I think also one thing that has really worked for me is um maximizing the use of platforms like um LinkedIn, um, uh, where she already touched on, on the networking. So I think uh, with the use of such platforms, uh, going to conferences, going to events where you network and connect with people has also been a great uh, way of getting access to funding opportunities and also learning from people who have done it before, um, how they navigate or how they go about uh, uh, getting the funds that they need. But also, we should also emphasize on getting the skills that are necessary. We know there are a lot of uh, applications that are going on, competitions, um, uh, social entrepreneurship challenges, but we need to produce quality applications in, in order to get or maximize these opportunities. So this is something that we also need to learn how to do. We shouldn't get the opportunities just because we're women, but because we're competent. Mm, 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 mm. I totally, totally agree with that. Uh, you know, just to 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 add on to that, it's crucial that we have the relevant skills if we're applying for um, you know, opportunities for funding for projects. And we need to have relevant skills for grant writing. But not only that, access to information is very important. And I always say this, including in my role um, as a youth envoy representing this demographic wave on Africa, how do you ensure that opportunities actually spread out and they go out to everyone uh, being, you know, able to know whenever there are opportunities that are open. I know of a few websites, for instance, Opportunities for Africans, Opportunity Desk, that also, you know, provide every now and again um, 
you know, opportunities that are available for young people. And having said that, within the Office of the Youth Envoy, we actually have a digital skills campaign called the Make Africa Digital Campaign. And this is in partnership with Google that we've since taken to seven countries. We're yet to launch and take it to South Africa and a number of countries that are upcoming. So it'd really be great as well to see how we can engage and have more young people upskilled, but also use that as a platform to share when the opportunities available for, for, for young people uh, to make more impact and accelerate their efforts on their projects. Having said that, we've sadly, sadly run out of time. This has been such an engaging conversation. The people online, our participants from the panelists has been so, so engaging and fruitful. And I hope that this is the first of many discussions. Maybe we should make this a series, uh, you know, and just call this the first series, given the demand we've seen for this conversation, which makes it very crucial. Um, I mean, we've heard from our panelists, uh, you know, as they finished speaking, I was also giving a few summary on, you know, what has been discussed from, you know, having women in the forefront of tech transformation, access to information, access to infrastructure, advocating for more leadership roles for young people, looking at the language barrier how that has impacted our young people on the continent in bridging the digital divide. You know, the skills of the future are very important. How do we reskill? Like for me, what really caught my attention was to say 50% of the population will need to be reskilled by 2025, which is next year. How do we look into that? Just to name a few. But this is just to show my appreciation of our panelists in sharing their expertise in this in this conversation, but also taking this opportunity to thank our organizers. I think it's crucial that we thank our organizers, the Office of the Special Advisor for Africa, also need to thank uh, the UN Communications Department under the UN Renewal uh, Magazine, uh, Afrique Magazine. Thank you for that. And um, most importantly as well, our audience that have joined us today. But I'll also just check in case Kingsley has anything you'd like to add uh, before we officially call it a close for today and for our webinar. So I'll hand this over to Kingsley. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been really, really informative. Uh, it's been uh, amazing. I want to thank you, uh, Shido and all the uh, Ruth, uh, Dr. Emmanuel uh, Umbali. It's been a fantastic uh, morning in New York. Uh, I know we have different times in different places. So the last thing I want to ask is don't forget to follow us uh, uh, at Africa Renewal. Uh, our website is www.un.org slash Africa Renew. I think you can just click uh, in the chat room to take you to our website and also on social media. We organize webinars three, four times in a year. So this is the first one. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get your contact information. The next one, we'll make sure to invite you. And we always focus on young people. So uh, I'm sure we'll have better collaboration and uh, more collaboration and a partnership in the future. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the day.